Come on in and have a seat, have a seat. Before we jump into our second lesson, a couple of updates uh, on prayer requests that I called to you all earlier. Uh, Troy Lepley is, is healing, and as, as of right now, he's doing all right. He went to the doctor. This is Colin and Andrew's father. He was having a lot of pain, and he went to the ER, and they found out it was kidney stones, and so he was rushed into surgery to take care of that. Uh, Janice Franklin had a lot of pain last night to the point where she blacked out and fell twice, and so... Uh, she went to the ER, and as of right now, currently, they're still trying to figure out what's going on with Miss Janice, and uh, she was, she's being transported to Mercy at this time, and so uh, we keep Miss uh, Janice in your prayers while they keep on figuring out. They kept on throwing different words, her enzymes are through the roof, and they need to break up a stone. We, we're not sure, so definitely keep uh, Miss Janice Franklin and Troy Lepley in your prayers. Yes. Yes, Moana Kibbe. As, is, was the surgery today or tomorrow? tomorrow? Tomorrow. And this is open heart surgery, isn't it? So definitely keep Miss Moana Kibbe, uh, for those who remember uh, Dwight and Moana, and so she's having open heart surgery tomorrow. Please keep her in your prayers. Uh, what song do we have for an invitation, Mr. Dennis? 594. 594. 594 will be the song of invitation after morning's lesson. We were going back through Facebook earlier, and I uh, was looking at some pictures, and uh, we were chuckling, and I found, I found the first picture where I took with Brother Mornay and Branson, and I read the caption, and it, and it said this. It said, first time meeting this amazing preacher, he does a good job, and I can proudly say that's my brother up there preaching God's word, and then I look at the picture, and this guy's face is like, who is this guy? But you know what? I, I love more, and I love I love, I got, love getting to meet, know him more and his family, Amanda. And what I love about uh, him and his kids, Avery and Spencer, is that both of our Amandas have celiac disease, and so we have to eat gluten free. And so we we share the pain of have, having to eat, you know, healthy and good foods. And I, we're all for it, and and we're streaming live, aren't we, Andrew? So I got to be careful what I say. But but we definitely found some Chinese food, and so that was that was amen to that. So that was good food. So food we didn't get to eat very much, and so we're so thankful to have our amazing wives and everything that they do for us. And so uh, Mornay, I ain't gonna take your time, man. And so uh, Mornay is what I was mentioned earlier. He is also an instructor uh, that he's assisting there at the Texas School of Preaching, and so there's no doubt you're gonna have a great one there. And so uh, and he's helping out with that and coming in kind of like a uh, what's the word? A adjunct? There you go. As a teacher there. And so uh, and good works are going on everywhere. And so once again, business cards there. Texas School of Preaching, our authentic Christian and everything else. We're going to wrap up tonight with six, or the six weaknesses of the mind that hinder our Bible study. Buckle up and listen to God's word being preached. Brother Mornay. Good evening once again. Let me express my heartfelt appreciation for the invitation again to come and preach and to preach unto you the unsearchable riches of Christ, as the Apostle Paul said. It's always a privilege to preach the gospel, but it is indeed a privilege to sit at the feet of men like Jason and Aaron who can proclaim the gospel boldly. Certainly was encouraged by their sermons, and I hope you were too certainly encouraging. Now, I just told Jason, I said, he should have been up here now. I should have preached first because uh, I just wanted to go home after that sermon. I just wanted to go home. I was fired up, ready to go. And so I appreciated that sermon very much. And I, and I thank you for the invitation and for hosting this, this lectureship. I hope that you will continue to do so because you know good will come out of it when we do the will and work of the Lord. And we know that that is what the Lord desires. In Paul's final address to the Ephesian elders, a very heartfelt address because of what is going to happen to the Apostle Paul and them telling him what is going to happen. He says the following in Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. So now, brethren, as he departs, now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. 
The word of God, he says, I commend you to that. I instruct you to it. I point you towards it, just like Jason did in the previous lesson. He pointed us towards the word of God because it will provide strength. And this is what the apostle Paul did. He says, I'm pointing you to the word of God, and it is able to do two things. It is able to edify. It is able to build you up. If you want to be built up in the most holy faith, then you need the Word of God. Why? Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You know, some time ago, long time ago, I was a Christian, and, uh, and I was walking on my way to services. I had to walk to services, and I'm walking to services, and I'm thinking about how can I strengthen my faith? How can I become better in my service to God? And I slapped myself upside the head, uh, so to speak, and, and I said it's because of the Word of God. The Word of God is going to strengthen you. The Word of God is going to help you be what you need to be. And so it is the Word of God is able to build you up. It edifies. It strengthens the individual. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 says, It will completely satisfy in the area of strengthening you to be what God would have you to be. But then the Apostle Paul also says that it will give you salvation. It provides salvation. It will give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Our salvation is tied to Holy Writ. You cannot go to heaven without following the scriptures. Let me say that again. You cannot go to heaven without following the word of God. We must follow the word of God if we desire to enter into God's heaven. We cannot know how to be saved and how to live righteous lives as the saved without the word of God. And in these things, the importance of our subject matter is seen here this evening. In these two facts... The Word of God is of utmost importance. It is critical to our edification. It is critical to our salvation. And so therefore, studying the Word of God is a matter of spiritual life and death. Studying the Word of God is a matter of spiritual life and death. If I don't study the Word of God, if I don't get into the book... If I don't make it a part of my life, if I don't immerse myself and submerge myself in the Word of God, I will not see God's heaven. And so it becomes critically important that I study the Word of God. And so hence anything that hinders our progress in studying the Word of God should be taken very seriously. Because it's messing with my salvation. If there is something that is hindering me, if there is a thought process that is hindering me, if there is a mindset that is hindering me from being what I need to be or studying the Word of God appropriately, I need to address it appropriately and I need to correct it. Because I don't want anything standing in the way of me getting everything that God wants me to get from His Word. I don't want myself standing in the way of edification and salvation. And so the topic that has been assigned to me this evening has uh, the weaknesses of the mind. It lists them out there on the brochure. We will go through those. Our study this evening is along those lines. We want to look at some weaknesses of the mind that hinder our study and subsequently endanger our salvation. And I want to say this from the onset of the lesson. This is no time to look at sister so-and-so and brother so-and-so. This is no time to do that. Tonight, I want us to look at ourselves. I want us to look within ourselves and I want us to ask the question are these weaknesses part of my life because so many times when the preacher is preaching then someone will say well you know sister sister so and so really needs to hear that sermon you know or brother so and so really needs to hear that sermon I wish they were here no forget about everyone else and let's focus on ourselves from everyone behind me all the way to the perimeter of the building if you can hear this sermon focus on yourself as you look at these things and so let's consider the things that are mentioned on the list that has been handed out. Consider uh, on the brochure. The first one is that of prejudice, a weakness of the mind, one of prejudice. And this is not of the pigmentation variety. We're not talking about racism that is a form of prejudice, but it is of the precept variety. How is prejudice defined? Well, prejudice is defined as follows, and it's important when we consider its definition, how it plays out. In the Word of God, this is a previous bent or bias towards certain things. It is something that you prefer, something you want, something that will receive your preferential treatment. It is anything that will receive your preferential treatment. It is a previous bent or bias. You have a bias for the thing. 
You are prejudiced towards it. You like it better. Some people, you know, they eat ice cream. They, they might, might like homemade vanilla ice cream. They prefer homemade vanilla ice cream above that of chocolate ice cream. You have a bias towards the one, and you have rejected the other. And so this type of prejudice can be divided into two categories of weaknesses when it comes to our Bible study. The first category is bias towards a certain doctrine. You know, having a bias towards a doctrine of the Lord here to the exclusion of every other doctrine. Underline that word, to the exclusion of every other doctrine. You may very well be preaching the truth. You may very well be doing that which is uh, right in the sight of God, but that is all that you do, just that particular doctrine. We call this usually the hobby horse or uh, the soapbox. It reminds me of an illustration. You probably heard it of of the elders approaching the preacher and say, listen, we've heard sermons about baptism and baptism and baptism for, for all year, and, and, and you know, we want you to, to, to branch out a little bit and you know, preach the whole counsel of God and maybe preach something other than baptism. You know, and they thought to themselves they're going to assign him a topic, and so they say, let's go to Genesis chapter 1, because certainly he cannot get baptism from Genesis chapter 1. And so he started there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and, the, uh, and, he, and with darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. Speaking of water, <laughs> right? And so the, the mind here is there is no uh, space or room for anything else. And so this student of the Bible spends his or her time in nothing else but in that particular thing. And this is a weakness, not a strength. And why is it a weakness? Because of what it can become. Notice what the Lord said to the Pharisees and the scribes in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23. This is a rebuke to the Pharisees and the scribes. I want you to pay careful attention to these words. Woe to you, Pharisees and scribes, hypocrites, for you pay tithe and mint and anise and cumin and have neglected... The weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith, you ought to have done these without leaving the others undone. The Pharisees and scribes were majoring in the minors, we might say, and minoring in the majors. And what we have to understand about this passage is that the tithing of mint, anise, and cumin was not wrong. The tithing of men, anise, and cumin is recorded for us in the Bible. That is what they were supposed to do, Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30. And all the tithe of a land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy. It is the Lord's. Deuteronomy 14 and verse 22. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And so the Lord did authorize the tithing of mint, anise, and cumin. This is in the scriptures. The problem was not the keeping of the law. It was their preferential treatment of certain parts of the law. The Lord says, this is all you're looking at. This is all you're, this is all you're considering. This is all you're focused on, and we understand why they did that, because of their materialistic ways and their covetousness. But the Lord says, this is why you're looking at it, and the Lord says, you ought not to have left the others undone. The Lord says, you ought to have focused on the weightier matters of the law, and you have to look at that. You have to look at the whole counsel of God, not just one thing. And so it may be the case that we are in danger of hindering our Bible study because we're only focused on a certain thing. Now, it's not wrong to have a favorite verse or a favorite study in which to engage. Don't, don't get me wrong. That's not what I'm saying. You know, some people have an area in which they engage. They, they love a specific study. They love a specific area that they, they want to study the Word of God in, and that's not wrong. But it is wrong to give preferential treatment to the neglect of the rest of the Scripture or the exclusion of the rest of Scripture. To only focus on one thing, and you don't preach or teach anything else... That's much like the denominational world. They, they won't necessarily look at the whole scripture or the whole counsel of God. They will look at one thing, and that's where they'll stay. And you try to take them somewhere else, and you try to say, well, let's look at this passage, but they're only concerned with one. And so Christians will stand sometimes on the pew arguing against instrumental music and things of that nature, but say nothing about other things. Let's just say the things that Jason talked about last night, the dancing, the drinking, the, the modesty, and all. We won't say anything about that, but let someone say something about baptism, and we're on it. 
We're on it. Let someone say something about instrumental music, and we're going to defend the scriptures, but we won't say anything about those other things. That's giving preferential treatment to those things which we agree with, right? To those things which we have a bias towards, but this over here that we don't agree with, we don't give treatment to that, we don't like that, and so we don't talk about it, and we don't study it. And that's how it becomes a weakness to us. Psalm 119 verses 4 through 6 says, Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. O oh, my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all your commandments. I will not be ashamed when I have respect unto all your commandments. But we will be ashamed if we leave off certain things for those things that we desire 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, as Aaron covered study to show yourself approved, a workman not needing to be ashamed, dividing a right, your hobby horse? No. Dividing a right, your soapbox? No. Dividing a right, only those things which you agree with and not the other things that the scripture says? No. Dividing a right, the word of God, all of it. When we are engaged in this type of prejudice, spiritual illiteracy is sure to follow. We may say someone who partakes only in his preferred study, will become unskillful in the word of righteousness, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. But I want us to move on and look at the, 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 uh, the second category here of bias, a weakness of the mind, and bias towards a certain viewpoint. Bias or prejudice towards a certain viewpoint. We can also be prejudiced towards a certain viewpoint and hinder the correct application of Scripture when we study. You know, we come to the Scripture with, to the study so that we may know what God wants us to do, right? That's how we approach the Word of God. We come to it because we want to know what God wants us to do. That should be how we approach the Scriptures. The psalmist would say in Psalm 119, verse 10 and 12, With my whole heart have I sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have I hit in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. I have put your word in my heart so that I might live righteous. He says, Lord, teach me your word. But this mindset, this mindset here of the psalmist is hindered by an existing bias for certain doctrines that are repugnant to the faith. When the biased student approaches the scriptures, it is not to fill his cup with God's word, but rather to use God's word to bolster his preference. And so there's a doctrine, there's something that may be repugnant to the faith that is contrary to the word of God, but because they have a bias towards it, whatever it is, they have a bias because of tradition, they have a bias because uh, their grandmother told it to them, they have a bias or a preference for that doctrine because uh, their wife or their husband, whatever it is, they have a bias towards it. And when they approach the word of God, they bring that bias with them. And many so-called scholars have abandoned reason, forsaken critical analysis and exegesis because of their own prejudice. It always amazes me when I consider the commentaries, and I'm reading through some of the commentaries of these uh, denominational individuals, and I'm amazed at, at some of the things that they say, and I'm going like, wow, that is very well put, and that is in line with Scripture. And the very next page, it would be a simple verse dealing with that which is righteous, and they would completely miss it. You know why? Because they are biased towards a certain viewpoint. They are biased towards their denominational views. D.R. Duncan said the following in his book, Hermeneutics. It's a, it's a good read. It's a dry read. I'll tell you that right now. It's an older book, but it is very good. I would encourage you to get that. Uh, Duncan's book on hermeneutics. The Bible is not a book with which to prove doctrines. It is the doctrine itself. Almost anything can be proven to the man who wants to find the proof. It leads to a wrong use of Scripture so that instead of searching them for whatever they may contain, the doctrines have been first assumed and then the Bible is compelled into some sort of recognition of that position. And so you have a bias, you have a prejudice towards a certain doctrine and you take that prejudice and now you're searching the Scriptures in order to prove your prejudice, in order to prove that you are right. Instead of going to the Word of God and saying, I'm going to study it, and if it proves my bias wrong, then it's wrong. Then I'm going to leave it off. With this mindset, we're not trying to learn what the Lord has to say. We are trying to get the Bible to prove what we have to say, and this ought not to be. 
In Acts chapter 27, or Acts chapter 20 and verse 27, the Apostle Paul said, I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. And that's what we have to do. We have to declare the whole counsel of God. Whether it is a hobby horse or a false doctrine, prejudice is a weakness of the mind that will hinder you spiritually as you study. When you come to the Bible, empty your cup. Empty your cup. Come to the Bible with an empty cup and then say, Lord, as thou will, as thou will, thy will will be my will. Not my opinions and my bias, but your will. And so that's what we can do to, to help us in our study to get rid of preconceived ideas or a bias towards uh, certain things, rather. But then consider number two. This is it. Preconceived opinions. Preconceived opinions. We are an opinionated people. That's my opinion, right? But we are an opinionated people. You know, that's why Facebook is so popular and social media is so popular. You know why it's so popular? Because they've created a platform for people to say and speak their mind. And because we're people who love to hear our own thoughts, that's what they did. And it's very popular. People like to hear themselves talk. They like to put their own thoughts out there, however stupid it may be. But that's why it's popular, because people like to do that. We like our own opinions. Having an opinion about something is not inherently wrong. You may like dogs, and, and someone else may like cats. That's okay. But however, preconceived opinions is a hindrance when it comes to studying the Bible. Let's look at the definition of what opinion is. an opinion is. Consider what the dictionary says. It is a personal view, a belief or judgment that rests on the grounds, underscore this, insufficient to produce complete certainty. It's an opinion you have, but it is insufficient to graduate it to fact or certainty or truth. So that's all it is. It's an opinion. Webster says the following. The judgment which the mind forms of any proposition, statement, theory, or event, the truth or falsehood of which is supported by a degree of evidence that renders it probably but does not produce absolute knowledge or certainty. And so an opinion is something you assert, but you cannot prove it with certainty. You cannot prove it to be true. I think. And so there is a lack of evidence to graduate it from opinion to fact. You know, when you consider evolution, people teach evolution in the Big Bang Theory. They teach it as what? They teach it as fact, right? It's impossible for it to be a fact. You know why? Because there's no evidence, none whatsoever, to prove it. You can't say something is a fact if you, do not, if you only have a small degree of evidence, and they don't even have that. They have no evidence whatsoever, but yet they say it's a fact. It's not a fact. It cannot be a fact. It is their opinion, and their opinion is wholly wrong. When it comes to the Scriptures, consider what the Bible says about itself. Consider what He said about God. Psalm 33 and verse 4, For the word of the Lord is right. The word of the Lord is right, and all His works are done in truth. Hebrews 6 and verse 18, It is impossible for God to lie. It is impossible for God to lie, and the word of the Lord is right. All of things that He does is in truth. Now consider what is said about the Scriptures. All Scripture is given by this God who cannot lie, whose word is truth, and all His works are done in righteousness. And so when you put the two together, you have the word of God, and you have the God of heaven, and the word of God that is written by the God of heaven is as true as the God of heaven. The two are not mutually exclusive. They are together. You can't separate the two. And so the conclusion then is the Bible is a book of undisputed, unequivocal truth. That's what it is. When you go to the scriptures, you're going to find the truth. Now here's the problem. What happens when incontrovertible truth comes face to face with conjecture or opinion? What happens when I have an opinion over here and the Word of God is over here? What is going to happen? You see, that is a problem when I study the Word of God. If I'm holding strong onto my opinions, we don't have to wonder about what happens. We have a beautiful account given to us by the Lord. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 9-10, through 10, we have the account of Naaman, remember? Naaman is the commander of the Syrian armies, and uh, he is he's sick with leprosy. And obviously his king wants him to live. He's a pretty good commander. Uh, and so his king wants him to live. And he sends then uh, to, to Israel, to the king of Israel, and says, you need to do something about this. And Naaman goes, pick up in verse 9 of 2 Kings chapter 5. So Naaman came 
with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. And so what do we have here? We have incontrovertible truth. What do we mean? Because Elijah is a man of God. He's a man, a proved prophet of God. We know he's a prophet of God, and he speaks the word of God. So what Elijah is saying is incontrovertible truth. If this man, Naaman, goes and dips in the Jordan seven times, he will be healed. Not he could be healed, not he may be healed, he will be healed. Why? Because it's the Word of God. That's what the Word of God said. If Naaman dips in the Jordan, he will be healed. But consider 2 Kings 5, 11 through 12. But Naaman was angry, and he went away and said, Behold, what? I had a different opinion. I had a different opinion. Surely I thought he would come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leprosy. Are not Abana and Fapar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? And so he turned away and went in a rage. And so what do you have here? You have the word of God on one hand and you have man's opinion on the other hand. And man said that his opinion is better. That I, I'm going to follow my opinion. I know that's what the man of God said, but I'm going to do my own thing. More often than not, when the two meet, man in his finite and foolish wisdom will walk in his own ways. He had a death sentence on his head, but he still was not willing to submit to the word of the Lord. How many do you know like that? How many friends and family members have a death sentence over their head? They are going to spend eternity in the fires of hell. And you've sat down with them and you've studied the word of God with them and you've showed them the incontrovertible truth, but yet they're still clinging to their opinions. Yet they're still clinging to something that they cannot prove from the scriptures. It's a sad situation. My parents are in that situation. I know many of you probably have family of that as well. But let's move a little closer. What about in the church? What about those Christians who have the sentence of death hanging over them because they are in sin? Because they're espousing sinful doctrines, they're doing sinful things, and they really want to do those things, and they have an opinion that it's not wrong. The preacher stands up and preaches and says it's wrong, but I know what he said, but I'm still going to do my own thing. That's sad. You're not going to make it. Why? Because you're choosing your opinions over the Word of God. How many times have we we've seen this happen uh, uh, with many people and, and so it is just good practice that when you come to the Bible to leave your opinions at the door I think I believe it is my conviction it doesn't matter what you think it does not matter what you think it doesn't matter what I think it doesn't matter what my estimation or conviction is it matters what God said and if God said it then I have to follow it I have to listen to it I have to obey it I cannot value my opinions above that of the Word of God. If I do, it is a weakness and it will cause me to be eternally lost. Consider this, number three, wishful thinking. What is wishful thinking? You know, wishful thinking is defined as this. It's the attribution of reality to what one wishes to be true or the unsubstantiated justification of what one wants to believe, Merriam Webster. Simply put, it is the belief in or the assertion of something because we want it to be so, not because it is so. In logic, it is called argumentum et passionis, arguing from the passions, arguing from the emotions, arguing from the feeling. This fallacy occurs when emotion is used instead of logical arguments, wishful thinking. And so I'm going to use emotion to prove my point. Wishful thinking then stems from emotion, not facts. I really want it to be true, be true, and so I believe it to be true, even though I cannot prove it to be true, but I really, really want it to be true. I really, really want this to exist. You may have heard people say, I know in my heart of hearts I'm right with the Lord, right? I just know in my heart of hearts. Well, how do you know that? This person does not have any facts to back it up, but they are arguing from emotion, not reason. That is wishful thinking. And as someone said, that argument is sound, nothing but sound. There's no facts to it. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 5, he says, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. 
He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Wanting salvation and having salvation are two different things. Some may be in here tonight who may not be members of the body and they may believe themselves to be saved. They really want that to be true and it's commendable. Who would not want to be saved and enter into the glory of heaven? It's commendable to want to be saved. But my belief that I am saved and whether I am saved according to the scripture, those are two different things. I have to look at the scriptures. I cannot just look at my feelings. Consider an example with which we probably deal more often than not. I know as a preacher I've dealt with this more than I care. Marriage, divorce, and remarriage. The law of marriage has suffered tremendous blows from the wishful thinker. The law that God has put in place has been changed to accommodate the desires and the wishes of some. Consider an illustration. Joe and Jane's marriage is over. No parties were guilty of fornication. They just decided they can't live with one another anymore. And years go by, and Joe meets a girl, and he falls in love. And his parents really like this new girl. But there is a problem. Joe must remain single or be reconciled to his wife according to the laws of God. Matthew chapter 19. That's what has to have. That's the law. But here's the problem. The wishful thinker approaches this situation in the following way. Certainly God does not want me to be single for the rest of my life. Right? He doesn't want that for me. You see, I want, I want this over here and here's the law telling me I can't and now the wishful thinker says but God really doesn't want me to do this the mom says you know God understands my son's previous marriage was not good you don't understand that woman wasn't good and so certainly because she wasn't good it gives my son the right to to go beyond the law over here certainly the laws of marriage don't apply in this situation and so what you have here is someone who wants something to be true they want it to be true because of something they desire and then the laws of God don't apply anymore it doesn't apply it happens so many times the law of God is thrown out the window because of what I desire to be true and that is arguing from the emotion you know marriage divorce and remarriage it's an emotional it's an emotional thing I mean, we're talking about relationships. We're talking about love and a strong emotion. And we're talking about families. It, it is a big thing. And when you have to deal with that, it is a very sad thing when, there are, when people have to be separated and all of those things. But God didn't make that. That is made when people don't follow the laws of God. You know, sometimes people say, and I've had this happen, a, a lady sitting across from me, uh, you know, talking to me and just crying with tears in her eyes. She says, what do you mean my, my daughter can't get remarried again? What do you mean? Certainly that's not right. And she really wanted to be so. And she's crying and she's sitting there with, with, with tears in her eyes. I said, I can't tell you anything else. I know that that is what you want. I know your heart is broken because she can't. But the Word of God still says what it says. Really, when you delve into it, it is a clash of the will and want. The Father's will and my want. But Psalm 119, 104 and 105 says, Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your lamp is a light unto my feet and a light unto my path. This is where I need to get in my Bible study. That when I pick up the Word of God, I get understanding from it. And whatever God says He hates, that's what I'm going to hate. Whatever God says He loves, that's where I'm, what I'm going to love. That's where I have to get in my maturity as a Christian. That no matter what it is, and no matter how hard it is, and it is hard, because of our own sin, it is hard. I'm going to follow God instead of following the feelings. Let's move on. Let's consider number four, generalization. Generalization uh, is, there's a different types of generalization, but it can all be summed up as follows. It is assuming that one part of something must apply to all, or because one part did not apply to something, it therefore applies to all. Presenting two alternatives as the only possibilities, when in fact more possibilities exist, not taking into account existing evidence. And simply stated, generalization is in the Bible, in the study of the Bible, is taking one situation or incident and applying it generally. That's a weakness when it comes to Bible study. And how do we put that as a demonstration? Consider the thief on the cross. This is generalization. Consider this. Luke chapter 23, verse 39 through 43. 
It says, then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Those who generalize have taken this passage and applied it to how all men are saved. That's generalization. They look at the thief on the cross, and when you talk to them about how one needs to be saved, they say, well, look at the thief on the cross. And so that is how all people are saved, by looking at that one passage. Because the thief on the cross was saved by Jesus in this fashion, all of us can be as well. Was the thief on the cross saved? Yes. There's no doubt about it. Jesus said he will be with him in paradise. We're not going to argue that the thief on the cross was saved. Jesus said he will be with him in paradise. But what you are doing is taking a specific situation with special circumstances and applying it generally, ignoring all other evidence. You're not even looking at the rest of the scriptures. And so it is the case that those who generalize that, they make a great mistake. Because that thief on the cross also was put on a cross. If you want to be saved like a thief on a cross, do we need to then put up a cross? And what about the sinner's prayer? He didn't say the sinner's prayer. So how in the world can he be saved, we be saved in the same fashion? And so we can go on and on, but that's generalization. What about uh, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake? I've heard this before. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23. No longer drink uh, only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and, and some frequent infirmities. You see, Paul said it's okay to drink. He said it. He said, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake. And some would take this passage and apply it to all sorts of situations except this general conclusion because these cases, a typical case, support it. Paul told Timothy to drink, and so therefore it's okay for us to drink. This is called hasty generalization. Geisler and Brooks record the following. He says, that wine was recommended for medicinal use. It does not mean and was, approved, uh, and was not approved for social use. The water diluted wine they drank was not quite a scotch on the rocks either. There are some serious differences that are wiped out by generalization. We're just generalizing it. Well, he said it and so it must be true. What about John chapter 3 and verse 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have life everlasting. You see, everyone is saved, the universalist said. Everyone is saved. That's generalization. The Bible is not ambiguous. We cannot form an entire doctrine on, on one verse to the neglect of everything else that is said about that subject directly and indirectly. We can do in that in our studies. Sometimes when we study, we, we pick that one verse and we come to the preacher and say, See, see, here. See here, well, have you studied the rest of it? Have you studied the whole counsel of God? Before we do that, we certainly have to. Consider number five. Appeal to human authority. Accepting something to be true because some human authority said so. My preacher said this. My pastor said this, and so it has to be true. Do you think this happens in the church? I know it happens in the church. I have a good friend who had a run-in with, with some, uh, you know, some folks, I almost said fools, but I guess they are fools. Uh, and they believed some, some things that were contrary to scriptures, wholly contrary to scriptures. That was things that were, that, that were just, when he told me about it, I said, well, obviously that's not true. I don't even know denominationalists who believe that. But you know where they heard it from? They heard it from a former preacher whom they respected and revered and they said, well, he said, that's appeal to authority. Well, he said this, and so that's why we believe it. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, Be followers of me, the apostle Paul said, as I am of Christ. As I am of Christ. I follow Christ. And, and here's the problem. Some appeal to human authority, irrespective of God's authority. Even though the Bible says what it says, they still listen to someone saying something different. And so this can be anyone. It does not have to be a preacher. It can be Joe. It can be your husband. It can be your wife. It can be anyone who you have great respect for. And you would rather follow them than follow the Bible. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, the Apostle Paul says this, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who hath called you unto the grace of God unto another gospel, which is not another. But there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. They're changing it. 
But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have received, let him be accursed. Paul says it doesn't even matter if an apostle comes and teach something contrary to the scriptures. Don't listen to him. You listen to the scriptures. You listen to the Bible. You see, and sometimes there are people in our lives, we love them. We have great respect for them. I had to deal with this as a, as a, as a preacher, <laughs> freshly out of preaching school, you know, baptism of fire. Uh, I, I, there was a man that I respected, a man who was instrumental in, in, in my conversion, a man who, who actually helped me to get to preaching school, and how, how crazy is that, uh, helped me to get to preaching school. And, and when I return from preaching school, guess what I have to do? Now rebuke this man on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Because he leave false doctrine on him. You see, it'd been, it'd been easy to say, well, this is a respected figure, and so I'm just, I'm going to believe what he says. No, but I've studied the Word of God, and I know what it says. And I have to follow the Word of God before I follow what my mom says, what my dad says, what people that I respect say. I have to follow the Word of God. The authority is in God, not in man. The Bible is not vague about this type of weakness. Matthew 15 and verse 8 and 9 the Lord says, These people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. We do not follow the commandments of men. We follow the commandments of God. It does not matter who you are. It does not matter what suffixes and prefixes surround your name. It doesn't matter if you are the so-called vicar of God here on earth. If you are saying something different than the Bible, then we are told not to listen. When you study the scriptures... Do not first then decide, I'm going to listen to what so-and-so says. Go to the scriptures. And if what so-and-so says is in line with the scriptures, that's great. But if it is not, reject it. Reject it. Last, consider this. An appeal to the popular. Another weakness of the mind, number six here. Appeal to the popular. I remember sitting down with my parents when I studied with them the gospel. They are Catholic. And I studied with them the gospel, and, 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 and I knew they got it. Uh, when you study with somebody, you can see the light go on. And I'll never forget what my dad said. My dad said, how can so many people be wrong? How can so many people be wrong? He just couldn't get over the fact that there were so many people who did not have it right. Even though he saw it in the scriptures that that's how it's supposed to be, his mind went to the outside world and said, well, all of them cannot be wrong. If everyone believes it, then it must be true. That is an appeal to the popular. This weakness does not concern itself with reality or truth, but popular, uh, popular rhetoric and majority opinion. Well, if everyone in the congregation believes it to be true, then therefore it must be true. Consider King Ahab, 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Now three years passed without war between Syria and Israel. Then it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down to visit the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramah Gilead is ours? But we hesitate to take it out by, uh, by the hand of, of the king of Syria. So he said to Joseph, Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to fight at Ramoth, Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Also Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire for the word of the Lord today. Let's consult God. Let's see what he has to say on the matter. In verse 6 of 1 Kings 22, Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go up to Ramoth Gilead and fight, or shall I refrain? So they said, Go up, for the Lord will deliver it into your hand of the king. Now I want you to pay close attention here. The Bible does not distinction, especially in the Old Testament, Old Testament, does not make a distinction between a false prophet and a prophet of the Lord. The context usually determines it. It doesn't say he was a false prophet. The context determines whether this is a false prophet or whether it is a prophet of God. And so it says the prophets here, these are false prophets. These are not prophets of God. And so this is seen by Jehoshaphat asking in verses 7 through 8, Jehoshaphat, is there not still a prophet of the Lord here? See, he understands that these guys are not prophets of God, that we may inquire of him. And so the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is still one man, Micaiah, 
the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him, because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say such things. Micaiah is not very popular. He's not a popular prophet, because he doesn't go with the majority. The majority of the prophet says, it's good, go up. Micaiah is saying, no, don't go up, because this is what the Lord says. And what would they rather do? They want to listen to the majority. The king does not like what he is saying, because it is not popular with him. This type of mindset is against God. Exodus chapter 23 and verse three, uh, 2 says, You shall not follow a crowd to do evil. Matthew 7 and verse 13, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in there at. And we have to understand that, that it, is, it is not constant, this popularity. Popularity is focused on trends and culture and social idiosyncrasies. All of these will change over time. People believe one thing today, they may very well believe something else tomorrow. And so this cannot certainly be the standard of authority. All of these things change with time. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13 says, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. I cannot hold on to the faith that Jude said was once delivered if I'm ch constantly changing with the crowd. If I'm constantly going to popular opinion. Isaiah 40 and verse 8 says, The word of the Lord endures forever, but opinions do not. Opinions do not. And so the church cannot go, well, you know what? The rest of the world is doing it. Isn't that what the denominational world are doing? The denominational world or the, the rest of the world, they're trying to be more inclusive of a homosexual lifestyle. They're trying to be inclusive of sodomy. This is what they're trying to be more inclusive of. And so what does denominations do today? They say, well, the Catholic church a couple of years, there is a place for homosexuals in the church, right? That's what they said. What are they doing? They're caving and they're giving in to popular opinion. You see, regardless if whether it is popular opinion, we ought to follow the word of God. John chapter 12 and verse 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words as one that judges him, the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Brethren, if you are the only one in this country standing for righteousness, you stand. You stand. If you're the only one in your congregation standing for righteousness, you stand. If you're the only one in your family standing for righteousness, you stand. Because it doesn't matter of the popular opinion. Why? Because God's the majority. God's the majority. And so when you go to the scriptures, don't look out here and look at what everybody else is saying. You look at what the Bible says first. And if everybody else is saying something different than the Bible, you ignore them and you follow the scriptures. Truth is not a democracy. Truth is not a democracy. Our faith is not based on what is trending. It is based upon what the Bible teaches. You know, the church is not a democracy. We don't get to vote on what doctrines we're going to follow. Right? The elders don't get to sit down and say, well, we're going to follow this doctrine. No, it doesn't work like that. The preacher doesn't get to decide, well, we're going to follow what's popular. We're going to follow these things. No, it doesn't work like that. There is a monarch in the church, King Jesus. He's the only one in charge, and he's already given his law. And so what do we do? Regardless of what anybody else says, we follow King Jesus. Because he's the one in charge. It doesn't matter what the popular opinions are. There are many other things, logical things, that we can look at that will hinder our studies. I hope these have, have helped you in some way to consider how you think when you approach the Scriptures. How you think when you live your life as a Christian. I hope that you can look at, as you go forth from here, and as you study the Scriptures, and as you live your life, you can ask yourself, listen, am I obeying God here, or am I trying to do my own thing? Am I trying to follow my own bias? When I study the Word of God, is there an opinion that is keeping me from following the Word of God? Maybe it's the case that I am appealing to the authority of someone that I should not. If you're here tonight and you recognize that you have an opinion that is contrary to the scriptures, would you change it tonight? Would you say, not my will, but thy will be done? I hope you will. Maybe it's the case that you, you recognize that you've always been told by so-and-so that this is how you're saved over here, but you've read the scriptures and you know, you know what God says about salvation. 
What are you going to do? Are you going to believe the scriptures? Or are you going to believe so and so over here? I hope you will believe the scriptures. I hope that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that he died a cruel death, as Aaron so beautifully explained to us how cruel that death was. He died and he was buried, but on the third day he rose again. To provide for us salvation. Salvation to enter into eternity. And don't forget the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven. You know that ascension is important. Why? Because Jesus is the first human being to ever enter into heaven. He's the first one. No one's ever been there. Everybody else is where? In paradise. They're not in heaven. But Jesus, He is the first fruits. He's going to heaven. And He is there seated at the right hand of the Father. And He has paved the way. And we can go too. How? I have to be in Him. See, eternal life is in Jesus Christ. 1 John 5.11. That's what the Bible says. Eternal life is in Jesus Christ. Well, how do I get into Jesus? How do I get into Christ? What do I have to do? The Bible says, Galatians 3 and verse 27, For we are baptized into Christ. Because when I'm baptized into Christ, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 says, That I receive remission of sins. That's what happens when I'm baptized into Christ. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. The Bible says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. And so do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Do you believe that He has provided salvation? Are you willing to have yourself immersed in water, to have your sins washed away completely because that's what the Bible says? Then why not repent tonight? Then why not change your mind about what the world says and what's popular out there and change it to that which is right? Because God commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts chapter 17, 30 and 31. And we have water here and we will take your good confession that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. What are you going to do tonight? Are you going to follow the Word of God? Or are you going to stick with your own opinions? I hope you'll do the right thing while we stand and as we sing.